Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fall to Question. Now, guys, I'm a bit late on the video. I meant to do some yesterday, but I was too tired from work, so I just came home and uh, re relaxed with my wife. We played some Quantum Break and some Sims 4 for a while. Also, guys, I immediately came... I just finished gr uh, Christmas shopping with me and my wife. We're shopping for gifts for each other, so we had to do it so awkwardly. That we had to hide stuff from each other. So, of course, I got some I'm my best friend boss stuff and all that stuff. I also, guys, I'd like to know where your guys' Christmas shopping has been going. Because I'd like to know what, you, or your holiday shopping, with your Hanukkah, or whatever you do. i like to know how your guys' shopping is going. Because I'm kind of curious about what you guys are doing and all that stuff. Well, anyway, welcome to chapter 37.5, The Shadow of the Industries, Rainbow Dash. Now, this one's about Rainbow Dash. She was my first favorite pony when she was my, when, when I was first into the fandom, Rainbow Dash was my first favorite, but, so she still has a thing in my heart there. Uh, Rainbow Dash is a pretty awesome pony, a bit cocky, but we're about to find out, out a little bit about Rainbow Dash in this chapter. It's about an hour long, about almost as long as the last episode, so... Let's get on to this chapter. I'm kind of curious what is to happen next. We, previous chapter, we found a little bit about Pinkie Pie, how, what she uh, discovers about herself, how she decided to try to fix herself. And the second part of it, or we also, second part of that entire memory, we found out where that mirror came from that little Pip saw herself in. Also, uh, I got a confirmation of what the hell my super mutant question was, superhuman behemoth. Um, which was that super, uh, super alicorn that, that, um, that, um, that K-Cat so happily m made clear for me. But thank you, K-Cat, that really cleared it up. Um, anyway, um, I'm just kind of curious what happens next, because now they have discovered that T Twilight's mom is still alive. Which I am very ha very eager to find out what happens. But think about it. You have to think about this. If Twilight's mom is a ghoul, is capable of being a ghoul, would that mean also that Twilight herself could have been become a ghoul if she was alive in normal circumstances? Twilight Sparkle, since she is genetically linked to tw um to Miss uh, to her mom, uh, Star Sparkle, I think, right? Star Sparkle. Correct me if I'm wrong, but either way, well, the story will probably do it, but but that means Twilight could have been a ghoul if she hadn't been eaten alive by um by a, by a, the goddess or Trixie, that matter. But now I'm kind of curious what is to happen next, because after they leave Canterlot, they actually have to go kill the goddess. Which I am fucking ready for. I am ready to see how they're going to kill Trixie. Like, oh god, I am so... Uh, the story is getting more motivating and more sad. It's getting to me in many ways. I feel this on a personal level and it's... I'm babbling again. Let's get on to the story. Ahead of us loomed a tall, curving building of feminine grace, adorned with large gemstones and crystalline latticework. If the Ministry of Wartime Technology Building was the king of the Ministry Walk, the Ministry of Image was clearly the queen. Everywhere else, Ministry of Image preferred to keep itself invisible, a shadowy hoof supporting all the others from behind the scenes. The Canterlot hub of the Ministry was a showpiece, the name of the Ministry wrapping around the facade in diamond-studded letters. Rarity, the mayor of the Ministry, had never appeared in any publication, poster, or product of the Ministry of Image. Here. She stood proudly before her ministry, as an alabaster statue lording over a fountain of glass and diamond dust. My plan, which had largely amounted to run, seemed to be working. Velvet Remedy and Steel Hooves galloped beside me as we passed between dead trees that lined the park. My lungs were burning, fighting for breath. My head pounded and my vision blurred. I could feel the strain on my heart and muscles as the pink cloud attacked every part of my body, inside and out. Still. No harassment from our enemies, but I had two red lights on my EFS compass. Look sharp, Seelhoves called out, his visor giving him the same warning. I didn't see any pony. Either they were invisible, or they were hiding in the draped alcoves of the Ministry. 
Calamity beat his wings, soaring upwards, wary of alicorns on the roof. It all happened in less than three seconds. We charged around the rarity fountain and right into the trap. A cacophony of beeps filled the air. Proximity mines. A oh, lot of them, shit. Many of which were magical energy based, virtually paved the space between rarity and the front door of the Ministry of Image. Many of them had already begun to flash as Velvet Remedy and Steel Hills drew to a stop next to me. My horn was already glowing as a field of magical levitation swept over the mines. The two alicorns stepped out of their hiding places and sat down, becoming statues as they instantly erected an alicorn shield around us, trapping us inside there with the mines. Pyrelight, who had been keeping pace with us, smacked into the inside of the shield and fell to the ground amongst the mines, dazed. The beeps continued. I parted the sea of beeping mines, shoving them into piles against the shield right next to the alicorns as I magically switched on the broadcaster which I had attached to my pit buck. Velvet Remedy telekinetically pulled Pyrelight back and wrapped us in her own magical shield. My head exploded in agony. My vision swam in red. Beside me, Velvet Remedy started to scream as the broadcaster's deadly necromancy attacked her and she held her spell. The alicorns jerked, opening their muzzles in a twisted cry of anguish, their shield dissolving. The mines exploded in a cavalcade of fire, shrapnel, concussive force, and magical energy. Shit. Blam. Blam. The turret exploded as Little Magnetosh sent two armor-piercing rounds through its innards. A twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle took out the last of the six security turrets. Compared to the security systems we had run into in the other buildings, this had been almost too easy. I stumbled into a plush bench face-planting into the cushions, and caught my breath. The other settled down, imbibing healing potions. The pink cloud had harmed us more than the alicorn's trap and the turrets combined. I could smell something foul from the cushion, but I didn't care. Even at a glance, I could see that much of the Ministry of Image was succumbing to rot and decay. The furnishings and decor had been chosen for appearance, not longevity. This doesn't bode so well. Calamity said with a grimace. I looked up wearily, pulling out a healing potion of my own. Shoving myself away from the blissful cushioniness of the bench, I moved over to where he was flying. Calamity was looking behind the lobby greeting counter. Steel Rangers. Dead. More than half a dozen of them. Sent by Cottage Cheese to retrieve the Black Book. Steel has noted solemnly, joining us. Yep, but what killed him? And who laid him out like this? I shook my head. Not a good sign at all. I turned away, tipping the potion and letting its healing liquid pour down my throat and tongue. Calamity was flying over the bodies, pulling ammunition from their battle saddles. Velvet Remedy was looking over the image directory hanging on a wall between two columns of twisting marble. Where were we expecting to find this book? Velvet questioned. Rarity's desk. A secret safe in her office. Velvet nodded. There's an executive elevator. For once, we might actually be in and out as quickly as Little Pip keeps hoping. Calamity coughed into his hoof. A cough that sounded a lot like a comment about liking mares. Rolling my eyes, I checked the map and started towards the elevator. It was just down the right hoof hall and around the corner. The hall was hung with backlit posters and gilded frames, each boasting the merits of other ministries. I pulled up short as I rounded the corner. The executive elevator was between two progress posters, one of which was a very familiar image of the glee-filled mare and her hoverbot, the other a group of ponies staring at awe at a glowing terminal. The elevator itself was richly designed, gilded with gold, and stuck open by the dead body of a steel ranger knight. The body of a scribe lay crumpled inside, slowly rotting. Her horn and the top of her skull had exploded, painting the back of the elevator car. Soft static poured out of the speaker of the roof above the elevator car. Um, maybe we shouldn't take the elevator, Velvet suggested as she caught up to me. As we wove through the maze of terminals, monitors, and meeting tables that seemed to make up the large bulk of media oversight, I was struck by the lack of skeletons or other signs of dead ponies. Not just in the Ministry of Image, but in the Ministry of Peace and Arcane Sciences as well. 
Perhaps it was the sight of the Ministry of Wartime Technology's atrium that reminded me that something was missing. The only dead here were Steel Rangers. Other than one message written in blood, there was no indication of pony death in Twilight's ministry either. The lighting in the room flickered on the verge of giving out. When we had switched them on, two of the light fixtures had exploded. Steel was paused, looking at a line of dust-covered mainframes along one side of the building. This room alone could have killed them, he commented. Just by seeing all the technology preserved here, and knowing they were here only for the book. I glanced at a nearby terminal, this one still glowing. Curious, I drew out my hacking tool. It was an extremely easy terminal to access. The password was Glitter. Media Oversight Intra-Office Memo Number 057 Just a reminder and clarification for ponies new to the Media Oversight's Division of Imagery. All pictures of ponies, including multiple, non-specific individuals, are required to have at least two to one ratio of ponies with bold or pastel palettes to ponies whose coats and mane bear neutral colors, such as brown, gray, or tan. A three to one ratio is preferable, though. The only exception to this is for ponies with white coats. White is Celestia's color, and is always permissible in any amount. Likewise, be sure that any planned photography be coordinated with at least one of imagery's pegasi. We want the image of Equestria to be one of glorious sunny days and bright starry nights. Overcast skies are to be strictly avoided unless required for effect. Color correction may be employed to make sure the sky over Equestria is an even deeper blue. In addition, remember that all images of zebras are to be monochromatic. Color photography should be rendered black and white, or passed through a desaturation and palette correction spell. Attached is a list of appropriate tints for zebra imagery. But a good rule of hoof is any coloration that gives the image a demonic or sickly appearance. Personal Memo Dearest Shutterbright, While I do appreciate your artistic thinking, and I agree that a bright and beautiful Equestria is most desirably aesthetically, I must decline your proposal that all imagery of Equestria display a sunny day. Please remember that Princess Luna sits on the throne now. Let us not set policy designed to wound her. Sincerely, Rarity. Media Oversight, Intra-Office Memo. Okay, um... I'm starting to realize this is a similarity to the modern PC way to speak nowadays. Um, here's this, my opinion on PC speaking. We have the right to think and say what we want. Though some things, yes, are not preferable, such as the KKK, KKK speaking. We can't tell them no because that gets rid of their rights. Eh... I don't know what your guys' opinion on SJWs or anything like that, but I don't think they should be correcting how we speak. I think that should be left alone. This is kind of un sort of off topic, but seriously, this is what it's reminding me of. Um, um, this is what that is reminding me of. They're censoring the way we see things. Um, like, she's trying to have a specific image to show like she's trying to censor daylight in a way sort of like a day like daylight because luna is in in the throne but seriously but if you think about it they're both technically in the throne in the show so what the fuck is the difference um anyway can, but it's just that Celestia does more of the day work while she runs the night. Nobody runs at night, so she, no, everyone thinks she doesn't have the throne. So, here we go. Number 162. All ponies within media oversight are required to attend the mandatory employee meeting tomorrow, starting promptly at 8. In this meeting, we will be giving you an overview of our new radio override system. Thanks to assistance from the Ministry of Awesome, we have been able to establish an equestrian-wide system for emergency interruption or enhancement of radio broadcasts. All ponies and media oversight will need to be familiar with the basics of this new system and how to access the ROS from either the media oversight office or the base station of any MAW towers. The meeting is expected to last for two hours. Lemon cakes and tea will be served. Uh, little Pip, Calamity said, staring at a dead monitor. Across it, some pony had painted a message. They eat your soul. Can we go home now? The Pegasus moaned. I didn't blame him. We continued on, 
even more alert and cautious than before. A dragon! Velvet Remedy gasped, echoing my own sentiment. Pyrelight let out a worried hoot. Yep, Calamity asserted as he flew over the book bins and tables of the restricted publications area. The rest of us had to walk around them. From what I could discern, the very long table I was passing had once been where a small legion of unicorns had magically converted books to new editions. There were bins for books beside each workstation, one labeled inappropriate and the other labeled corrected. A poster on a nearby bookcase showed a dark blue earth pony reading over a book, with more stacked on each side. The poster read, Be diligent. We check your work. We had passed through the book review office to get to this room. That makes this much more difficult, Steel has commented. I do not believe we have the firepower to kill a dragon of that age. Velvet Remedy frowned. You ponies do realize this is probably Spike's mother we're talking about, right? She nickered. Show a little compassion, why don't you? I winced. But right now, she was a threat to Equestria. A giant living pink cloud factory. I don't think we have to. Calamity stated. Killer, I mean. A crazy alicorn lady already solved the problem for us. She's already dead? I exclaimed in surprise. Calamity shook his head. Nah, seems the alicorns got hold of a spell that'll turn a big mother dragon into something small that don't breathe cloud. Or at least it'd only breathe tiny puffs of the cloud. Field mouse, I think. Velvet Remedy stopped, staring. A spell that turns a dragon into a field mouse. Yep. And how do we cast this spell? She queried. Why do I have a feeling? I'm pretty sure it's outside of. Why do I have a feeling that Calamity is somehow descendant between Applejack's family? Somehow. I'm pretty sure one of her uh, her family members might have broke the tradition and married and had slept with a Pegasus. Yes, guys, I'm bringing that in. I'm bringing the tradition story eight in it. Uh, but it's kind of obvious all her family is earth ponies. It's kind of right there. It is possible for another race to go with another. Hey, look at the cake family. Although I'm very, very, very still skeptical about that. I'm still skeptical about that. The scope of my spellcraft, and we know it's outside of Little Pips. Rub it in, why don't you? I'm the one who found that spell, the not Trixie personality had said. I'm the one who cast it. Taken care of, Calamity grinned. Crazy alicorn lady already cast the spell. Well, sort of. Sort of? Velvet Rarity prompted. I wasn't sure if she was asking what he meant, or correcting his grammar. Calamity assumed the former. Way I hear it. She used something that the Ministry of Magic came up for the Ministry of Morale. A way to cast a spell and hold the effect on a trigger. Calamity rubbed a hoof against the back of his neck. To be precise, a way to cast a spell into a present. A spell goes off when the present's opened. She had a quirky name for it. Spell in a box, I guessed. Yep, Calamity said as he landed next to a set of cages labeled Sanitation. That was it. I ducked under the table between us and trotted up to him, glancing at the clipboard which hung next to the cages. For processing of dangerously seditious materials, please read instructions carefully. From what I read, the empty cages once held trained parasprites, which had been ensorcelled to eat the words off pages. I wondered if they only ate specific words, or if they rendered the whole book blank, and thus gloriously sedition-free. Makes sense. I thought aloud. With the thickness of the pink cloud down there, she probably couldn't actually approach the dragon and cast the spell herself, so she had to cast it into a spell in the box. I wonder how she got it down to the mother, though. Well, she made a deal with a couple of the Canterlot dragons, Calamity said. Oh dear, Velvet said. No wonder her personalities were in crisis. She really was on the verge of rendering half of herself obsolete. How do you know all of this? Seals asked. All fucking night long. 
I take it the present hasn't been opened yet, has it? I looked at Calamity expectantly. So, that's what we have to do. That would mean setting Steelhoves into the treasury. There weren't any other of us that could survive it. Open her present without getting transfigured into a field mouse. Well, not exactly. What? I stared up at Calamity in disbelief. We had gone up a level, and were working our way through the brightly colored educational reform floor as Calamity explained the plan that the Alicorn and the Ministry of Arcane Sciences basement had devised. When Calamity was finished, I felt all reason had left the world. Who the hell ties something this important to the start of a gala? I huffed. That's insane! Calamity fixed me with a level stare. Behind him was a poster of Happy Foles playing in a cheerful-looking schoolyard under the arch of a rainbow. What part of what you saw down there in that basement screamed sanity to you? I groaned, pressing a hoof to my face. Okay, okay. Let me see if I've got this. In order to stop continuous replenishment of the pink cloud, we have to trigger a spell in the box that will turn the treasury dragon into a field mouse. The trigger for the spell in the box has been rigged into the fireworks display for the Grand Galloping Gala. I remembered Pinkie Pie's endorsement on the Philadelphia Fun Farm poster in Steel's shack. Everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been. Every day, forever. In Equestria's final year, Princess Luna had given over the Grand Galloping Gala to Pinkie. The fireworks had been rigged up to one of her instant party systems. But the gala never happened. The mega spells rained down, and life in Canterlot had ended. No more parties. And the trigger to set off the fireworks is in Princess Luna's private chambers in the royal castle. I understood now why Calamity had said we needed to go to the castle. I was so frustrated I could just scream. Why wasn't anything ever easy? How would we know if it worked? Velvet asked. Asking Steelhoof to wander into a dragon's lair and check had clearly never crossed her mind. Calamity pulled something out of his pack and spit it onto his hoof. With this... He held up a large pink gemstone with a flaw deep into it, an artificial flaw in the shape of a rune. Spell in the box goes off, this little dial and lights up. I wondered if this was the it that the alicorn had been searching for. You stole that on the way out of the basement, didn't you? Velvet asked rhetorically. A blob of red light appeared on the edge of my EFS compass. I spun, trying to spot the source. My ears perked, catching a low, unearthly hum. It sounded similar to the warping, grating sound of a canterlot ghoul reviving, only softer and caught on a single note, like a broken recording. But there was nothing there. Just a short, colorful bookshelf, carved and painted with hearts and rainbows and prancing pony children. The bookshelf itself contained equally colorful books. The paint was peeling away now, and two of the shelves had rotted through, spilling their contents onto the floor. Above was a chalkboard with a story problem. In Sunshine's hometown of Ponyville, the reward for turning in zebra sympathizers is 500 bits. Sunshine reported her bad uncle yesterday two zebra sympathizers today, and will report another tomorrow. If half the ponies she reported are proven to be zebra sympathizers, how many bits will she receive at the end of the week? A dark shadow formed on the blackboard, then bulged, pressing through it, a shadowy cloud that reached through the wall like a grasping claw. I froze, trying to process just what I was seeing. The shadow cloud grew, moving towards us, splitting into multiple floating tendrils. The unhollowed hum was coming from it, growing louder. The lights began to dim, like the thing was devouring the illumination in the room. One tendril curled down, passing through a desk, totally insubstantial. The I, I know this is going to be unrelated, but this is reminding me... I know it's going to be really unrelated to this at all, because this is way before this happened. This is reminding me of the Tantalus. This is, like, this is giving me Tantalus vibes, and it's also giving me some serious Evil Within 2 vibes. Hell of it pulled out of the chalkboard, the thing fully in the room with us. I tried to kick on Sats, but my targeting spell faltered, unable to lock on. 
Whoosh. The rocket from Steelhoof's battle saddle arrowed past me, moving through the shadow cloud as if it was really just a shadow. The rocket struck the far wall in a loud explosion of fire, dust, and colorful debris. The blowback knocked me down, toppled bookshelves, threw a table. The shadowy cloud barely reacted to it, its tendrils still reaching out towards each of us. I skittered back, away from the snaking shadow, certain of what would happen if it touched me. They eat your soul. Our weapons were useless against this creature. No armor would stop it. I was no longer surprised that all the Steel Rangers who made it this far had perished here. Velvet Remedy cast her shield, wrapping the shadow cloud in her magic. It pressed its tendrils against the wall of the shield, the shadow molding over the surface, unable to get through. Velvet Remedy had contained it. No, them. The shadow was a swarm of tiny, jet-black necrosprites. They could pass through solid objects, but not through magic fields. I shuddered shakily, releasing a breath I didn't realize I was holding. I'll keep them contained, Velvet said. You all go on ahead. Pyrolite landed on her rump, looking insistent on staying. We nodded and ran off, leaving her holding the swarm. The book was here, in this room. I could feel it. I had been in Rarity's personal office before. It was much the same, although gnawed on by teeth of time. A dress pony stood in one corner next to an ornate chest. There was a note attached to the chest, written in Rarity's elegant script. Thoughts on the dress. The goal is to create elegant yet functional armor of moderate weight and classical style. I have chosen a color scheme of amaranth and gold that harkens back to the dress that my beloved friends created for me for that first gala so long ago. I remember the dress! Oh, that was where she sung in the art of the dress. Oh! Don't make me cry! I'm already feeling emotion in this. There's soul eating. There's already soul eating ghosts, but now you're gonna bring in the happy feels. Uh, honor of my dearest and closest oh, oh, friend. Oh, 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 wait, oh, wait, that reminds me. That reminds me, guys. Oh, I found this game on Steam. It's pony based, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you guys tomorrow because I saw it. And I really wanted you guys to see it. So anyway, guys, let's continue. I am drawing on my best skills at haute couture. The armored plating, particularly over the breast, it's will draw inspiration from the armor worn by the royal guards. I have woven a little magic into the dress. Although only the metal plating will stop bullets, cloth should hold up well against bladed weapons, as well as being resistant to wear and tear and general dirtying that I have come to expect from a battlefield or a gallo. I jested that I might make the final version indestructible, but it was only a joke. I did, after all, tell Applejack that I would not do any such thing. And besides, the reaction from my top magician would have been enough to put me off the idea, even if I had been serious. He was right, of course. With what I have done, I most likely do not have enough soul left to spare even a little of it. Anyway, I am very pleased with my first pass, but the final dress needs to be even better, beyond mere perfection. The Grand Galloping Gala is still months away, so even with all the insanity here, I do have plenty of time. It is my most sincere hope that most, if not all, of my friends will be at the event this year. If so, I hope to convince them to allow me the honor of fashioning each one of them a similar, yet unique, elegant Ministry Mare armored dress. Normally, the gala would not be the venue I would choose to show off the first in what I would hope to be a new line of fashionable armor. But this year, Pinkie Pie is finally living her dream and has been put in charge of the event. So really, all bets are off. I floated up my screwdriver and bobby pin, picking the lock on the chest with relative ease. Opening it. I laid my eyes on the armored dress. It was utterly beautiful. I thought you said the book was in the desk, Calamity said, flying up from behind me. Whoa, Nelly. Yeah, I whispered, pulling the armored dress out and looking it over. Uh, little pip, Calamity said timidly. Could, uh, could I have that? I didn't know you liked to wear dresses, 
Steele was intoned as he joined us. Calamity spun around in the air. I... I don't, he insisted. It's for velvet. I snickered as Steelhoof's neighed mockingly. Of course you can, Calamity. She'll look exquisite in it. I passed the dress to Calamity and moved to the desk. Technically, it would fit should she... It would be suit since she is a descendant of Rarity, of Rarity's family. Well, she's a... Sorry, can't English. Uh, she is descendant of Sweetie Belle, but what Sweetie Belle in turn is the sister of Rarity. So basically, she's her great 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 aunt. Uh, so... I closed my eyes, drawing on the memory of how Rarity had opened the secret compartment. One of the gems embedded in the front of the desk concealed the lock. Opening my eyes, I extended my magic over the desk, moving aside the gem. I began to pick the lock, this time using just my magic. The lock was deceptively easy to pick, almost like the compartment wanted to be opened. I slid open the hidden compartment. There. Laying amongst the papers and detritus like a sleeping dragon was the dark tome, perfectly preserved, its ancient pages filled with the most powerful and forbidden magic between covers of the blackest leather. I reached out with my magic. I felt a cold shock as I touched it with my meager ability, the book promising to unlock greater powers and mysteries that I never dreamed of. I didn't have to be a one-trick unicorn anymore. With this book, I could be magic if I wanted to powerful enough that I was worthy of being a bearer of that element. It was mine. Velvet Remedy made her way to us slowly. Her horn was still glowing, and beads of sweat fell down her forehead. Oh. Do you just... Uh, just like that, she has, has the book. Why would you have to portray it like that? My heart right now, guys, is racing. This chapter is making my heart race. It's in Rarity's Ministry. Why isn't it Rarity's Ministry if it's about Rainbow Dash? Just saying. She was pouring most of her concentration into maintaining her shield, even though it was out of sight. Once we were outside, she would release it. The Necrosprite Swarm hadn't left the Ministry building in over two centuries. We were hoping it wouldn't now. I gave equal odds that either the magic woven into the Ministry walls that kept the Pink Cloud out also kept the Swarm in, or that the Swarm had remained here, drawn to the presence of the Black Book like moths to a lantern. I turned to stare at the pony-sized poster on the wall. I had seen it before on a massive billboard in Manhattan. I hadn't liked it much then. I liked it less now that I actually knew a zebra. Ponies love laughter. Zebras do not understand joy and fear it. Ponies are honest. Zebras tell only lies. Ponies are loyal. Zebras will knife you in the back. Ponies are generous. Zebras are selfish and greedy. Ponies care about each other. Zebras care only about themselves. Okay, here's the plan, I said knowing the others would not like this. Every pony else runs to the Ministry of Awesome. I'm going to slip into the Royal Castle and set off the Gala Fireworks. Alone? You're gonna what now? Not a chance. The very responses I expected. No, little Pip, Calamity said as he swooped close to me, backing me against the wall. I should do this. I'm faster. I'm more maneuverable. And I called it. This is my mission. I slipped out the MG Stealth Buck too and floated it before them. I can get in undetected, but it has to be me. Just me. I was the only one with the Pip Buck. There was no room for discussion. Ah, oh, pony feathers. Calamity spit, bucking his hoof through the pony sized poster. If you find the goddesses, Velvet Remedy said slowly, still concentrating. I frowned. I didn't want to find the princesses. Please, no! My mind conjured nightmare images no! of bare skeletons fused together in the throne room, and my heart stopped. 
I'm so terrified of what it's gonna be. I want to know, but I don't want to know. Why? I'm legitimately crying. Those sisters. I keep thinking of more and more, and I'm terrified of what happened to them. I don't want them to be ghouls, but I also don't want them to be fair, because they might be feral ghouls. And if they are ghouls, they're fucking permanently... Ah. Ah. And I don't want them to be dead. What if they're alive? The whole time? That would piss me off! Oh, God. Just for a moment. I wasn't sure I could handle finding them, seeing where they died. I certainly didn't want Velvet Remedy to bear witness of such a devastating horror. If I find the bodies of the princesses, that won't mean I've found the goddesses. They're transcendent souls. I ignored Calamity's snort. But you will tell me what you find, right? Velvet Remedy insisted. I really didn't want to. Promise me. I only nodded, feeling a tear form in my eye. I prayed to the goddesses that I wouldn't have to either honor that promise or break it. I begged them silently that I would find nothing. Calamity flew up to me again, this time with the pink gem in his teeth. He tossed it to me. Now you gotta promise me something, he said softly. You gotta promise you're gonna do this. See it through. I looked at him with surprise. I quickly nodded. Of course I would. I'm serious, little Pip. I really want it to be me. He lowered his head, looking ashamed. I know it in my heart, but my head needs convincing that we're still the good guys. I need this. I floated up the pink gem with its rune flaw. Then maybe you should hold on to this, I offered. That way, You'll know when it's done. Calamity shook his head. Look, as much as I'd love to, y'all might need it. Without it, how else will you know if it's worked and y'all can come back? He looked away. No way I'm going to leave you hanging there just to satisfy myself. I nodded again and tucked the gemstone away. Calamity flew silently ahead. We moved into the stairwell and descended. The black book radiated an unpleasant coolness through one of my saddlebags. I was beginning to question whether I was really intending to give this to Trixie. Maybe my plan, whatever it was, needed revision. Or maybe there was something inside the book that would take care of Trixie once and for all. What was it that Rarity told Applejack that the black book contained? Magic to tear souls apart. Maybe. Maybe I could even save Twilight Sparkle. I hurled the black book against one of the pillars in the royal throne room. I floated out another healing potion and downed the contents, hoping it would relieve the pounding in my head and the tightness in my chest. The royal castle was filled with pink cloud, thicker than outside. It had rotted away the tapestries, turned the... That's something I didn't think about. That's something I really didn't think about. Like, what if you could save Twilight with the Black Book? I'm not willing to use the Black Book if I was my, my, I was, I was in the situation. If I was a pony, my pony is a unicorn. You can tell in the fucking photo. Right, right, right in the, sorry, right, right here. You can tell right here that my pony is a unicorn. But seriously, I am not prepared to find out. The story is making me dread everything I find out. It's making me not want to know anymore. But I still want to continue. I have mixed feelings about the story, K-Cat. What have you done to me? I am the... I am becoming... I am fangirling. Yes, fangirling, not fanboying. I'm fangirling! But I just want to find out more. And more.
Hey, Cat, you are an amazing writer. You should, this, you should be writing more books. I'm just going to say that now. Carpets and draperies and a greasy residue, cracked and discolored stained glass, and decayed the once royal furniture into collapsed heaps of debris. The golden fountain pools at the foot of the royal throne were tarnished beyond polishing, and stagnant with thick pink sludge. At least, there were no bones in here. No skeletons of Celestia or Luna. I knew I shouldn't have paused. I needed to keep moving. If I dallied, the pink would kill me. Or the stealth buck too would die, and the alicorns would kill me. But still, I had stopped, my curiosity strangling me, threatening to kill me with razor claws if I didn't at least look inside the book. Just a peek. I had stopped, telling myself I would just crack the cover open, that I was just making sure that Paris Sprites hadn't eaten the words right off the pages. The black book was written in archaic zebra glyphs. Every damn page. The book wanted me to read it. I was sure if I studied it, the answers would come to me in dreams. But that didn't help me now. The little pony in my head was throwing a tantrum. Red lights moved about on my EFS compass. I clamped my muzzle closed, biting my lower lip. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I dashed over, retrieving the book, shivering at the frosty surge I felt from it whenever I touched it with my magic. Two alicorns stepped into the throne room, their shields up. As far as I could tell, the alicorns in the castle never dropped their shields. They seemed more resistant to the pink cloud, but they were not immune, and with the cloud's concentration here, they were limiting their exposure. I crouched behind the throne, hiding even though I was invisible. I could feel the cloud eating at my insides, gnawing at my muscles, clamping down on my lungs and heart, seeping into my bowels. I already wanted another healing potion, but I had to hold off or I would run out. Princess Luna's private chambers couldn't be far. I could probably make it on a short gallop if these two would just leave, or at least move so their shields weren't blocking the Celestia damned doorway. I don't see anything, one said, turning to her companion. But I feel something. The room feels colder than it was before. What the hell? Was the Black Book a damned refrigerator? No, that made no sense. It's definitely The safe so. it was in would have been freezing. Was the alicorn sensing something metaphysical? I suddenly wondered how Pinkie Pie would have responded to the proximity of the Black Book. I feel nothing, the other said, at least partially confirming- That is a good question. Pinkie Pie's pinky sense is goes off the radar and she was on PTMs! Oh yeah, I, I got an explanation of why Pinkie Pie, there was a good explanation because the Pinkie Pie's PTM inducement kind of had something to do with the trans movement of a, between Pip and R Pinkie Pie. But, seriously, like, if, what if Pinkie Pie's PTM induced Pinkie Sense had something that could feel this? What would she do? How would she respond to it? Boom! God. Bring my suspicions. We should inform Nightseer. She will know what to make of your sensitivity. The alicorns took one last look around. One of them walked up to the throne, tilting her head and looking straight at me. Through me. There is nothing here, she said, turning back and rejoining her sister. We go. The door to Princess Luna's chambers was sealed with a lock, almost identical to the one which had secured Princess Celestia's chamber back in her school. Hmm. A very tricky lock, but familiarity helped me open it swiftly. I pushed open the door with a hoof, and stepped swiftly away as thick pink cloud rolled out in the hallway. The cloud was pulled in here in lethal concentrations. I could barely make out the ceiling, which I noticed formed a once beautiful mosaic of a light blue sky with wisps of clouds and a cheery sun. I couldn't make out the far wall at all. I floated out a healing potion, drinking it. I felt it repairing my heart and lungs, taking the edge off the thudding in my head. My stomach settled. I took a deep breath. I charged into the room, my horn glowing to provide light. 
I was looking for the pressure switch for the gala. Immediately, my heart tried to seize. My lungs lost their cache of air, and as I began to choke, I felt like a thousand tiny spiders had hatched in my intestines and were spreading throughout my insides. I found her bed, closet, dressers, but I didn't see any switch. I dashed for the doorway as those spiders started to bite and sting. I slammed the door closed behind me, pulling out two healing potions and downing them. As my mind cleared, I realized I had only one healing potion left, plus a super restoration potion. I would need to make at least one more run through the room. I nudged open the door, stepping back. I lowered myself, preparing to run. A spot of red appeared on my EFS compass, stopping the motion. I moaned, shaking. I hoped the invisibility spell would hold out. The last thing I wanted right now was a fight. Come out, come out, my little pony. The alicorn's majestic voice rang in my head, as well as my ears. I turned and watched as she ascended the staircase behind me and stepped into the room with me. She was one of the forest green alicorns, but her coat was so dark it appeared sheer ebony. Her mane and tail flowed behind her like plasma, rippling in a non-existent wind. She wore armor made of bones, a saddle fashioned from a pony's ribcage, with wing bones splayed out across her own. From her neck hung a pony's skull, with an exceptionally long and slender horn. Thick whiffs of pink cloud rolled along the floor from Princess Luna's chambers behind me, curling at my hooves. Long. I felt myself slender. trembling. The alicorn stopped, looking right at me, then looked about the rest of the room. Her horn glowed as she slid a small knife out of her armor. The knife hovered for a moment before whipping around, slashing two deep cuts across her own shoulders. The alicorn began to bleed. My eyes widened, but I couldn't stare at her self-inflicted wounds. My eyes were pulled back to the pony skull with its long, slender horn. The alicorn cast her spell, and the blood from her wounds began to drip upwards, flowing out into the air, swirling and pooling. Her eyes glowed as the twin pools of floating blood forged themselves into wicked, curving blades. I felt myself trembling again. Not with weakness, but with horror. I knew that horn. I had seen it before in a memory. No. Sister, you called for me. The twin blood swords launched through the air, spinning, slashing at me. One glanced off my barding, bouncing away. No. That Celestius. No. No! Why? The other left a deep wound across the left side of my neck. Blood began to pour down over my armor and left foreleg. I hissed in pain, staggering. Oh yes, I see you, my little pony. The alicorn laughed from behind her shield. Do you really think you can hide from knights here with your pathetic little invisibility toy? What a silly little pony. The blood sword spun back through the air at me. I felt another chill as I pulled out the black book, deflecting one of the swords with it as the other struck against my armor with enough force to bruise. The first sword disintegrated into flakes of ruddy powder as it rebounded from the book. Oh? Well, what do you have there? The alicorn purred. What are you? I grunted, feeling a wave of weakness and nausea. I was losing blood. I needed to take the healing potion before I bled out, but... The other blade of blood slashed around. Hold on. I cantered out of the way. Yes? Yeah? Love you too. Okay, just put it right there. 
Well, anyway, guys, uh, hold on. Sorry about that. The edge barely missing my muzzle. I floated the black book up, trying to strike it, but the blade dodged away, returning to its mistress. I tried to keep my eyes locked on the blood sword, but my gaze slid from it, latching again on the sight of that skull, that slender horn. This... This is going to be the Luna Academy for Young Unicorns, a magical school of my very own, just like yours. The ribs, the wings, the skull with its slender horn. I knew they were all from the same pony. The blade straightened out and shot straight at me, aiming between my eyes. At the last moment, I magically tossed the book in front of my face. Red mist poured around its edges the sword dissolving as it struck the black leather cover. I believe I'll be taking that. Knight's here focused, wrapping her magic around the book. Her shield faltered for a moment, and she felt the cold shock of the book's aura. But only for an eye blink, not long enough for me to use it for an advantage. You dare? I was trembling even harder now, but not from weakness or horror. The alicorn took the black book, easily prying it from the grip of my telekinesis. But I didn't care. The black book was nothing to me. Nothing compared to what Nightseer wore around her neck like a trophy. And you die, she said so, casually. So even worse, it's not Celestia, it's Lunas? Almost yawning as she took the book for herself. Motes of magic formed about her, fashioning themselves into eldritch knives. My legs gave out. I dropped to my knees. They splashed in a thin pool of my own blood that was becoming saturated with pink. My lungs were burning. My head throbbed harder. I didn't care. Be unwavering. I focused on that skull with its long, slender horn. The host of magical knives darted through the air at their target. Knights here glanced down as she felt her necklace shift. With a telekinetic thrust, I drove Luna's horn through the soft tissue under Nightseer's muzzle and up into her brain. She twitched once, the spark of life remaining in her just long enough for the eldritch knives to strike home. Most evaporated against my new barding, but several of them sunk in deep before vanishing along with Nightseer's shield spell as the alicorn crumpled to the ground. Hell yeah! No healing potions left. No super restoration potions left. Almost every unarmored part of my body wrapped in healing bandages. I faced Princess Luna's private chambers. The room filled thickly with pink. The black book was once again in my saddlebags. But my sense of obsession was fading, overpowered by other emotions. Just like the chill from the book was overpowered by the heat of the fire behind me. I had stripped Luna's bones from Nightseer, and I was burning them. It was the only semblance of a proper burial I could offer her now. I faced Princess Luna's private chambers, and I continued to pray. The smoke from the fire behind me curled around me, black and acrid. The pink cloud floated out of the doorway in front of me in wisps. The smoke pushed its way inside as more of the cloud flowed outward, forcing me to slowly step back until I could almost feel the heat of the fire breathing against my tail. I jumped as I heard a boom of thunder from inside Princess Luna's chambers. The ceiling mosaic had changed, the puffy white clouds growing thick and dark. A moment later, it began to rain inside of Luna's room, the sudden deluge washing the pink out of the air. I heard it gurgling out of small vents in the floor. Shaking, I began to laugh. I looked upward and shouted, Thank you! The goddesses had heard me and answered my prayers. Either
Either that, or this was the most peculiar design for fire protection ever. Galloping into the pouring rain, I looked about. Finding the switch was easy now. I threw my hose against the pressure plate, then spun to face the chamber's only window, jumping up onto the dilapidated remains of Luna's bed to keep my hooves out of the pink water that flooded the floor. Outside the window, I could hear pops and bangs. A ribbon of glittering golden light shot into the air and burst into a prismatic spray of light. I fished out the pink gemstone, just in time to see its soft glow fading. Success! The gem's light died, and I saw the rune inside had burned out, replaced by a blackened smear within the stone. I jumped on Luna's bed, squealing with glee as another light exploded outside of the window, showering down on Canterlot with all the colors of Celestia's flowing mane. I knew there were more fireworks going off that I couldn't see. Many more. For a moment, the thunderous explosions rivaled the sound of a hundred steel hose firing away. Then they exceeded it. I shifted away from the window, eager now to get back to my friends. On the opposite wall, I saw them. A collection of Ministry Mayor statuettes. All six, gathered together, just like they should be. Lined up in a crystal display case. I realized that only Luna and Spike had kept intact collections. Even Rarity had separated the ponies in her set giving herself to her sister Sweetie Belle, keeping Fluttershy with her wherever she went. I wrapped my magic about the case, taking it with me. "'Will you look at all of this stuff?' Calamity said with a tone of awe. Watcher had told us that the Ministry of Awesome had been repurposed as a warehouse, but I had never pictured this. The interior walls had been knocked out, the entire building was a gigantic black void filled with seemingly endless rows of crates, filing cabinets, and metal boxes. The rows were divided into clear sections that stretched the length of the building, each section filling with containers painted in a single color. Small diamond-shaped lights hung from the ceiling at intervals, many of which had burnt out. The effect was like staring down the length of a rainbow under a black sky sprinkled with stars. Are y'all seeing all of this? Yes, Velvet said, staring. Can we just... No, Calamity, I answered. It would take forever, and there was no way we could carry it all. How about just one row, Calamity pleaded. No, we can't, Calamity. I looked about. What we're looking for is behind a shield, and behind defenses. I don't think it's in this room, which means it's probably below us. Fan out and look for a way down. Well, shoot. Y'all are no fun. Calamity complained as he flew off. Pyrolite swooped into the air, a streak of emerald and gold between the rainbow and the darkness. Velvet, hold up. I said, as she and Seelhose began to trot down the yellow section and green section respectively. Velvet stopped, turning towards me. Then... Unable to help herself, she struck a pose. Admiring it, she cooed. Isn't this just lovely? She was wearing the armor Calamity had given her. When I first saw her in it, my heart had skipped a beat. And now that she was posing, my heart skipped another. She grinned, watching my expression. Or do you prefer this? She dropped down to a sultry, pouty pose, and my heart threatened to stop altogether. I suddenly felt a little hot. No. I, uh, um, wow. No, not this again, Pip. You, you already have somebody. She beamed. Damn it, this wasn't fair. I wasn't supposed to be thinking like this about Velvet Remedy anymore. I needed homage. So, how do I look at it? Lickable, I whimpered. She blinked innocently. What was that? <clears throat> pretty, pretty, I coughed. Oh my god, you said that aloud! You said that aloud! Blushing. Very, very pretty. And armored, which is good. Good that you finally have some armor. She gave a charming laugh, getting up. 
Why, thank you, little Pip. Looking up at the spot of air Calamity had recently occupied, Lickable. she purred. I wish I could get the same response from our flybuck. Our barded bard? I said, gazing at her. Velvet Remedy face hoofed and shook her head. I was waiting for some pony to say that. It had to be you, didn't it, little Pip? I started, realizing that I had forgotten why I had called her back. I have a gift for you, too. She blinked, putting down her hoof. Really? You'd think it's my birthday with all this. She watched as I pulled out a wrapped bundle. With a slightly chiding tone. Is it a weapon? No, 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 no. I said, slightly wounded. But this is very, very special. And you have to promise not to take it apart. Or remove anything from it. Ever. Velvet Remedy now looked curious and slightly worried. Promise, I required. It's important. All right, little Pip. I can see that this is important, at least to you. I promise. I floated the bundle over to her, unwrapping the crystal case from Princess Luna's bedroom. Velvet Remedy gasped, her eyes immediately going to Fluttershy. She reached out with her magic to take the case, and I heard a sharp intake of air as the magic of each statuette flooded over her at once. Back in the royal castle, picking up the case had had no effect on me, but then again I already possessed a full set. They were already giving me what they had to give. I kept a net of levitation magic beneath the crystal case, just as a precaution should the gifts of the statuettes be too overwhelming. Velvet Remedy's eyes widened, first with alarm, and then understanding. Where? she asked, her voice trembling a little. There were tears in her eyes. Princess Luna's private chambers. These were hers. Now, they're yours. And did you find... Just bones, I said sadly. Their spirits have gone somewhere else. I didn't say any more. Little Pip, you're four, Calamity shouted as I emptied Little Macintosh into the body of the Ultra Sentinel, penetrating its armor but failing to take it down. It rolled closer, moving fully into an aisle of orange boxes and cabinets. I spun, terrified to see another of the rainbow-painted robot tanks bearing down on me from behind, the turret of its main gun locking onto me. The Sentinels. Wrapping myself in a field of levitation, I kicked off of the ground. Both Ultra Sentinels fired at me with high explosives. I'm surprised they aren't calling them Flash Sentry Bots. Just saying. I tank guns, slaying each other. The next dial over, Sealhoofs was facing at least two more, opening up with his grenade machine gun. The tanks were taking the battering, firing back with a multi gem rapid fire magical energy gun. The scream of the magical energy weapons dampened as one of the tanks went down. The flickering orbs of energy above my head and Calamity popped as Velvet's disintegration ward saved Steelhoofs from being turned to ash. Steelhoofs fired several more grenades, then retreated around the corner, smoke curling off of his armor. Several plates of the armor were gone, taking melted flesh with them, leaving egregious and gaping wounds that seeped with the dark fluid that formed a Canterlot ghoul's blood. He stumbled in pain. The missile launcher in his battle saddle was half disintegrated. More than just a diet of scrap metal would be needed to repair that damage. Calamity started to reach back for Spitfire's thunder, but I waved him on. My EFS compass was now completely red, solid no matter which direction I turned. There's gotta be a hundred of these things in here, Calamity. And this was only the first line of defense. The goddesses only knew what else was in here. We aren't gonna fight our way out of this one. You need to find the controls and shut security down. You're the only one of us who can. I whipped out my sniper rifle, loaded with magically enhanced bullets, and floated over the top of the shelves of crates, taking aim at the badly damaged tank bot which had sent Steelhoofs running. The multi-gem magical energy weapon swung upwards on a universal joint, aiming all of its barrels at me. We opened fire together. My new armor took the first four of the five shots it got off in the space it took me to fire once. The fifth blast of magical energy struck me like a ball of molten steel, burning into my chest. 
unbearable agony exploded in my chest as my rib cage saved my heart, but at the cost of one of my ribs disintegrating completely. My scream was inequine. My magic imploded as I dropped. Simultaneously, the bullet from my sniper rifle struck directly into the center of the tank bot's magical energy weapon, ripping through its core matrix. The top of the Ultra Sentinel exploded in a flash of multicolored energy. My body hit the shelf full of orange metal boxes like a rag doll, bouncing off and landing hard on the floor amongst the jagged shards of slain tank bot. I felt one shard slice into my armor, jabbing into my stomach, but not deeply. An odd static-like detonation echoed a few rows over. Steelhoof let out a scream, more of rage than pain as I heard his metal armor collapse to the floor. I groaned, an indescribable pain in my chest. I was having trouble breathing. They're changing tactics again, Velvet Remedy yelled from somewhere further away. Little Pip. The air filled with the sound of crackling explosions. A wash of charged energy flooded the aisle, bathing me, making the hairs of my coat and mane stand on end. My EFS sparkle winked off. I twisted about slowly, lifting my pip buck. It was dead. Matrix disruption grenades. That meant Steelhoves was immobile, and my pit buck was just a metal part of my leg until I could reboot it. Which might be tricky without Steelhoves' armor to reboot it from. I heard the metallic whine and rumble as another Ultra Sentinel rolled around into my aisle. I tried to float my sniper rifle up and around to fire at it, only to realize I didn't have it anymore and wasn't sure where it was. It must have fallen into the other row. This rainbow-painted tank bot had a grenade launcher as its primary weapon, probably the one that had just sprayed the area with Matrix Disruption Grenades. The secondary weapon was an integrated, high-powered rifle, and it was swinging around to aim at me. I focused, the glow of my magic surrounding dozens of crates and metal boxes on each side of the aisle. I may not be able to dislodge the tank bot's spark batteries before it could fire, but I could certainly float enough crap into its way to act as a shield. The tank depowered. Yeehaw! And that's how we do it up in the sky. The shimmering field of magenta magical energy surrounded about one fourth of the basement. The shield was easily as powerful as the Super Alicorn's shield in Philadelphia. Velvet Remedy took a deep breath, looking a little nervous, and then stepped forward. The direct descendant of Sweetie Belle passed through the shield unharmed. It didn't even frizz her mane. She turned back to us, letting out a breath and looking relieved. This part was easy. Having to actually explain to Velvet what she needed to do to disable the generator was more difficult than bypassing the shield itself. I motioned her on with my hoof. At this point, the only thing that could possibly go wrong is if she ran out of air inside there before deactivating the generator. Not something that seemed remotely likely, bear in mind. A few minutes later, the shield melted away. Velvet stood at the depowered generator in the center, looking quite accomplished. In here were the greatest secrets of the Ministry of Awesome. I turned to Calamity, who was prancing in the air like a little filly who just got her cutie mark. Hate to do this to you, Calamity, but could you please go get the Sky Bandit? His face fell. I actually felt bad for him. What? Now, but... But I'll... Steelhoves can't move. My pit buck is dead. We can't go back the way we came. We need to risk a landing right in front of the Ministry of Awesome. This was insane. But I couldn't think of another way. Fortunately, we had seriously thinned out the alicorns on Ministry Walk, and the fireworks had scattered most of the rest. There was no telling for how long, though. Calamity looked disappointed, almost grievously wounded by my request. I looked at him seriously. You're the fastest and most maneuverable amongst us, and the only one who can bring our ride. Get the Sky Bandit and position yourself above the cloud. Take my binoculars and keep an eye out for us. The moment we're out, swoop down and get us. <sighs> All right. Dang it, he said dejectedly. I floated out the pink gemstone with the scorch mark inside. This is yours. It's done. Calamity smiled wanly. Thank you, little Pip. 
I owe you one. He slipped the gem into his pack, looking a little better. The orange-maned pegasus and the desperado had pivoted and flew away, casting one look back at the treasures he was being denied. I hope sacrifice is a virtue. I rotated and looked at the crates and cabinets before me. On one end of the previously shielded area was a mainframe with several terminals. In the center, under a spotlight, was a stand with a small lockbox, the sort used to hold memory orbs. I gasped as I saw the symbol emblazoned on the lockbox. A burning hoof. Minutes later, I was laying on the floor of the Ministry of Awesome, staring at the contents of the burning hoof lockbox. Six memory orbs. Each sat in a plush velvet indentation with a symbol pinned underneath of it. An apple, a butterfly, a star, a balloon, a cloud with a lightning bolt through it, and finally, a diamond. I took a deep breath, then leaned forward and touched my horn to the first one. I felt my host swallow nervously as she walked into the darkened circular chamber. Huge arched windows stretched upwards, giving a breathtaking view of a brilliantly starry night. A circular window above the arches perfectly framed the moon. Moonlight fell through the chamber to illuminate a large round table. There were seven chairs, six with emblems emblazoned on their backs, one which was taller than the others and inlaid with obsidian and lapis lazuli. My host strode up between the chairs, looking at the table. The chairs were cushioned in red. The same emblem from the back of each chair was also inlaid in the table before them, where a dinner plate might be set. To my host's left was the image of Gears and Sparks, bisected with a blade, the symbol of the Steel Rangers and the Ministry of Wartime Technology. To her right was the image of a large star ringed with smaller ones, a tall horn above them and wings to each side, the Ministry of Arcane Sciences symbol. Directly across the table, I could see a cross overlaid with a butterfly. My host didn't look at the others. The rest of the table was taken up with a map of Equestria. There were markings indicating battle lines where the zebras had managed to push into the country. Most of the war, however, was being waged in the zebras' homeland, and in the sea and lands between them. My host's gaze lingered on a small part of Equestria that had been lost, including a crescent-shaped canyon. Littlehorn Valley. All over the map of Equestria, tall mushroom-shaped models had been placed. At first, I thought they marked balefire bombs, but then I realized they were white, and their stalks were tall and needle-thin. Towers. Some pony flew overhead, picking up one of the towers in her teeth and moving it half an inch. The Philadelphia Tower should be on that side of the city, Rainbow Dash said as she landed on the opposite side of the table sitting down in one of the chairs. The symbol in front of it was almost identical to her cutie mark, but with purple wings lined in black. I had seen that symbol on one of the Shadow Bolt's uniforms. Where should I sit? My host asked, her voice holding a reserved country twang. Rainbow Dash shrugged. Why not your sister's chair? I'm sure AJ won't mind. Apple Bloom's eyes widened. I couldn't do that. A door opened and Princess Luna strode into the room. I felt a javelin skewer my heart. Apple Bloom and Rainbow Dash both bowed as the princess took her chair at the head of the table. Good evening, Rainbow Dash. Welcome back, Apple Bloom. Apple Bloom gulped. Please, up. I didn't want her to stand back up. This was painful. I was in the presence of Luna, my goddess living in well, not even an hour after I had burned her bones. After seeing her defiled by an alicorn, I wished for Apple Bloom to remain bowed, or at least to look away. Apple Bloom stood back up, realizing Rainbow Dash had already been standing, and turned her attention to the princess. It's good to hear that you're finally doing something with the ministry I gave you, Rainbow Dash, the princess said, chiding a little. Now, Tell me about this new project. It seems vast. Oh yeah, it is. Rainbow Dash grinned, flapping her wings. It seemed she couldn't remain seated long. Remember how you told me you wanted my help building the Equestrian Skyguard? Well, here's my answer. The Single Pegasus Project. Sounds... impressive, 
Princess Luna said patiently. What is it? In a word, weather control. That's two words. Applebloom whispered to the Cyan Pegasus, who shot her a look. The single Pegasus project was... weather control. Well, I guess that made some sense if the Enclave was able to alter the tower so they could plant crops in the clouds. Weather control, Luna said, tilting her head curiously, echoing my thoughts, then taking them in a whole different direction. So this project will allow us to rain lightning down on enemy positions, mire their convoys with torrential downpours, drive them back with hurricanes and hail. Rainbow Dash's jaw nearly hit the floor. She closed in, zipping around the room. Oh, yeah, this is even more awesome than I thought. I mean, I knew it would be awesome, but I never realized just how awesome it could be. Princess Luna chuckled. Oh, goddess, I loved that chuckle. I was in awe of it. Then what were you thinking of using it for? Rainbow Dash stopped in mid-loop and hovered, turning back to the princess as she shook off a blush. Well, way I see it, this war will be won through air superiority. No offense to Twilight. I mean, we have it, they don't. She flew up to the table. Problem is, we don't have enough combat flyers, especially now that the zebras are using dragons. There simply aren't enough Pegasi because they're all too busy already, keeping control of the weather. And the ones we do have often have to leave for other obligations. Hell, even I have to abandon the war once a year to help Ponyville wrap up winter. Surely some other Pegasus... Princess Luna started to say, but Rainbow Dash interrupted her. Not a chance. They need me. I won't leave Ponyville hanging. Princess Luna looked cross for just a moment, then smiled and nodded. Of course. Looking back at the map, she bid. Continue. Well, with the single Pegasus project, we're going to finally automate all of our weather making and weather control systems. The towers you see here will control the weather over each area. The wild rainbow made Pegasus grin broadly, almost dancing with anticipation. Check this out. Rainbow Dash pulled out a little switch and tossed it. Both Apple Bloom and Princess Luna jumped as a crack of thunder roared over the table, and black rings of smoke expanded out from each of the model towers, crackling with energy. That would start the rain. Having seen a downpour from Princess Luna's ceiling, I was mildly surprised when miniature clouds didn't form and start flooding the table. I designed it after the contrails of the Wonderbolts, Rainbow Dash boasted. Everything about the single Pegasus project goes through me, and it doesn't get my hoof approval unless it's cool. I felt my host roll her eyes. And it'll all be under the management of one single Pegasus in the Rainbow Dash hub of pure awesome. We're still trying to decide on a name. Apple Bloom quickly interjected a Princess Luna's chagrined expression. Rainbow Dash looked a little put out. Hey, it's my project and my ministry. Anyway, Apple Bloom said, taking over. The pony in the central hub would be placed in a sort of induced coma. An induced coma, Princess Luna said, sounding shocked. Well, we haven't exactly worked that part out yet either, Apple Bloom admitted. But we're really close, Rainbow Dash interjected swiftly. Apple Bloom's company is working on a modifying a life support pod, and I'm going to be talking to Twilight and Rarity to see if they have any ideas that could help. I see. The princess didn't sound fully convinced yet and hooked up to one of our new Crusader computers. Applebloom continued, only to have Rainbow Dash interrupt again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But none of that download your braid nonsense. I had them disconnect all that shit. I want a living pony running Equestria's weather, not some machine that thinks it's a pony. Applebloom sighed, then continued once more. The pony and life support pod will be mentally linked to the Crusader, which will allow her to manage running all of Equestria's weather. Does it have to be a Pegasus? The princess asked. Yeah? Rainbow Dash proclaimed. Well, no, not technically, but it should be. Princess Luna looked over the map and all of its towers, at least four dozen in all. You've given me a lot to think about. This would be a massive expenditure of resources. Yeah, but totally worth it. Rainbow Dash pushed, sounding hopeful. 
Princess Luna nodded. Most likely, she agreed with a smile. And I believe the ministries of morale and image each have proposals that could be integrated into this. The princess stood. And the central hub will be a prime target for assault, so it will need the best defenses that the ministries of arcane sciences and wartime technology can devise. But it's still going to be my project, right? Rainbow Dash asked. It's still going to be the Ministry of Awesome. Why, of course. That's a lot to think. Uh, that, that is a pretty interesting concept. Hmm. That's a good concept. The weather moving on its own. Thanks to the machine. I, I, this, this gives me a lot to think about of why the place is constantly sealed up. The clouds are. Maybe the Enclave made it that way so it stayed that way. It also made it where they have cloud seeding as Cl Calamity did. Uh, uh, um, man, there's a lot of info. But I didn't answer my questions about where the fuck is Rainbow Dash! Rainbow Dash was not in there, in the tower, in her little house, little uh, tree house. So I'm a bit pissed off about that. Still don't know where the fuck she is. And there goes my phone. Okay, that's... <sighs> well... Guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, interesting chapter. I had a lot of emotions flow through me in this. Well, I hope you got... And I hope to see you guys in the next video. So, I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye!